Okay, thanks, Aaron, and welcome to everybody out there. My name is John Ellison. As Aaron said, I'm with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. I've had a chance to look at the roster, the sign-up list here, and I have a lot of respect for all of you in your professions and your fields, and I know a few of you. And so thanks for being here. And I'm Kim McCachron of the Arizona Prosecuting Attorneys Advisory Council. We're really happy to have you attend, and uh, we just have thrown up this fair use slide so that it's clear that uh, we're properly using other people's material. Okay, well let's start with a quote. To give real service, you must add something which cannot be bought or measured with money, and that is sincerity and integrity. Really, in the criminal justice system, whether you're a police officer, or a prosecutor, or probate, whatever, integrity is the most important thing. And integrity, honesty, and trust is what holds the whole system together. The Brady issue is about so much more than just disclosing evidence. In many ways, it's the keystone to the criminal justice system. As with a building in the last stages of construction, the keystone might not always fall easily into place. Captured in the Arizona Prosecuting Attorney's Advisory Council mission statement is the ultimate measure of the prosecutor's work, building from the foundation laid by law enforcement. That mission statement reads, empowering Arizona's prosecutors through training and advocacy to achieve justice. Echoing Mr. Adams, our quoter here, uh, ensuring justice is to give real service. And we have to relish the challenges provided by our opponents because they test our ability to meet that goal, our own self-interest notwithstanding. Our work is for naught, no matter how well we do it, if the public is not satisfied with our service. As U.S. Attorney Jenny Durkin from the Western District of Washington observed at a recent Ninth Circuit Brady debate, the system that we're talking about today relies on trust. Our courts are different and they are special. And I really mean that to my bones. If you sit outside any courthouse in this country, in any corner, any county, any city, any federal courthouse, and you watch who walks in that courtroom, you will see people of every stripe, young, old, white, black, gay, you name it. They walk in as victims, as witnesses, as family members, as criminal defense lawyers, as judges and bailiffs. And the people walking through those doors bring with them the things that are the most important in their life, the most important things. And then they take those problems and they hand them to complete strangers to decide. And they do it for only one reason. They do it because they trust. They trust and they have faith. And I think we must do all we can to keep and maintain that faith. It does not mean we can scrutinize but it should mean we should not politicize because our courts cannot become as lowly thought of as the other branches of government because then people will not trust them and I believe our society will perish. Thank you. From this, from this graph, it is clear that the public opinion in America is always in flux. Faith in law enforcement rebounded from 48% in 2014 to 56% by this last December. But what this really tells us is that despite an Arizona crime rate, which is the lowest in decades, particularly when compared with population changes, just under half the public sees a lack of integrity in our service. Even before 2014, prosecutorial best practices committees were popping up all across the nation. In her 2013 New York Law Journal article on best practices, Christine Hammond, now the DOJ BGA visiting or BJA, Visiting Fellow of Best Practices for Justice, observed, some commentators see wrongful convictions around every turn, often not distinguishing between misconduct and error, but little time is devoted to how prosecutors approach their ethical obligations. That comes from getting it right, practical approaches to the 21st century prosecution. Her article highlights two critical skills needed by prosecutors and law enforcement thorough investigatory abilities, and ethical and fair evaluation of every bit of evidence. Without this, the decisions of who and what to charge and what constitutes evidence of guilt that can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt are less dependable and our system is in jeopardy. At that Ninth Circuit debate that Ms. Durkin was speaking at, 
Uh, Sidney Powell, a former U.S. attorney turned defense lawyer and author of the book License to Lie, which traces the mistakes in the U.S. DOJ Ted Stevens case, among others, cites the standard a government should aspire to. But I think the higher standard needs to apply to the Department of Justice because it should be a shining example in all respects, and all U.S. attorneys should be able to stand in a court and say, I represent the United States of America with the greatest amount of integrity. That comment applies, of course, to all government lawyers. While we intellectually know that this is the standard, it is in that spirit of self-scrutiny that best practices command a regular revisit and reinforcement of the special duties that law enforcement and prosecutors as the guardians of the system assume. That said, for all the discussion on this topic in policy circles, because we work in the trenches, we know that for the most part our work is sound and misconduct is not the norm. But I think the higher... So this... And we need to do more. We are rightfully held to the highest standard. As I said, we know it is our obligation. Um, but the facts show that true misconduct is not only not rapid, it is rare. The second point I'd like to make is, even though it is rare, we know that's not good enough. While we are a human endeavor, we also understand we need to do more. So this is something that we really buy into. We know, and I know because I, I work with law enforcement at all colors and capacities, we know that everyone is committed to this ideal. So this webinar is designed to synthesize the cases from Brady through Milky, examining the rules and best practices along the way, down the path to integrity, ultimately putting it all together so that each of you can understand the why, the what, and the how of criminal discovery and increase the trust in the criminal justice system and our ability to protect the public. The worst thing about a Brady violation is you don't know what you don't know. The defense attorneys have no way of getting the evidence that the government has unless the government hands it over in many, many cases. The, the over 90,000 cases since Brady versus Maryland first came on the scene 50 years ago serve as our resource for articulating our path to integrity and ultimately justice. But Brady comes first. So we hear this Brady v. Maryland, and we thought it would be helpful just to go through the brief facts. In 1963, the United States Supreme Court decided Brady v. Maryland. Two men, Brady and Boblett, were charged with felony murder. They were tried separately. Before his trial, Brady sought permission from the prosecutor to examine all of Boblett's statements to the police. The prosecutor showed several statements to Brady but failed to disclose the statement in which Boblett admitted that he, not Brady, killed the victim. Brady was convicted at trial and was sentenced to death. Later, Brady learned of Boblett's statement and moved for a new trial citing the violation of due process. The lower court found that the undisclosed evidence warranted the new penalty phase, and the Supreme Court agreed that the failure to disclose that statement justified a new penalty phase trial. The holding of the case tells us why it matters. We now hold that the suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to an accused violates due process where the evidence is material, either to guilt or to punishment, irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution. Still quoting the case, society wins not only when the guilty are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. Our system of the administration of justice suffers when any accused is treated unfairly. An inscription on the walls of the Department of Justice states the proposition candidly for the federal domain. The United States wins its point whenever justice is done its citizens in the courts. A prosecution that withholds evidence on demand of an accused, which, if made available, would tend to ex exculpate him or reduce the penalty, helps shape a trial that bears heavily on the defendant. That casts the prosecutor in the role of an architect of a proceeding that does not comport with the standard of justice. And of course, we here, we here in Arizona and all around the country subscribe to that as well. As with any case 
existing precedent, Brady has evolved through subsequent application of the law. For example, Miranda v. Arizona was decided in 1966. It's never been overruled, yet court cases at all levels revisit Miranda almost regularly, examining its original holding, applying it to new facts, and adding to it, clarifying it, and creating new precedent. To illustrate, the original Miranda decision did not address most aspects of custody, but since then our courts have developed a firm definition of what exactly defines custody. It is incumbent upon us, the criminal justice practitioners, to make sure we're following the most current Miranda guidance provided by the courts. Since 1966, Miranda has evolved, although the core of the decision remains. Brady is no different. Since 1963, Brady, Brady has been cited over 90,000 times. Many of these subsequent cases have added to the original holdings or clarified terms and issues. With that in mind, we now follow the Brady Trail to get to the state law as of today. Why is Brady disclosure a duty? The requirements of Brady derive from the U.S. Constitution Due Process Clause. So a Brady violation is a constitutional violation. Because all law enforcement and prosecution professionals swear an oath to the Constitution, we have a duty to society to follow Brady. In this side-by-side -side list of these duties, we can see a bit of difference in that the prosecution carries responsibility for disclosure relating not only to direct evidence, but relating to its witnesses and knowledge of the evidence that should be disclosed is imputed, whether the prosecutor knows it or not. We will be exploring this in more detail in a moment. So what is the extent of the Brady disclosure duty? Basically, we must disclose all evidence to the defense that is favorable to the defendant and material to the defendant's guilt or punishment. In his article, Discovery Danger Zone, The Brady Rule, Douglas L. Pipes identifies at least six categories of evidence favorable to a defendant, specifically evidence that mitigates against punishment, opposes guilt either directly or indirectly through things like third-party perpetrator evidence or uncharged crimes. It could be evidence that supports the defense disclosed to the prosecution as part of a reciprocal discovery. It could support a defense motion that erodes the prosecution's case or evidence, and it's evidence that is, impeaches a material prosecution witness. The analysis takes us first to materiality and then on to favorability, both of which are captured in Mr. Pipe's list. Materiality. Evidence is material only if there is a reasonable probability that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different. A reasonable probability is a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome. That according to U.S. versus Bagley. Material depends on the nature of the evidence itself and its potential impact on the case as a whole. The best practice is, of course, to disclose. But we need to look deeper as it is not always apparent at the time of trial. In Strickler versus Green, we get some instruction. Strickler and Henderson abducted and murdered a young college student, and Strickler was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. At trial, Ann Stoltzfus testified in detail about the abduction and identified Strickler as a perpetrator, relying on her, quote, exceptionally good memory, close quote. But according to police documents that were not disclosed, Stoltfus had previously admitted she had a very vague memory of the event and initially couldn't identify either of the victim's abductors. Strickler was convicted without knowledge of this discrepancy. The pivotal question was whether that failure to disclose amounted to a Brady violation. The court held that it did not because the documents were not material for Brady purposes. Quote, notwithstanding the obvious significance of Stoltzfus' testimony, petitioner has not convinced us that there is a reasonable probability that the jury would have returned a different verdict if her testimony had been either severely impeached or excluded entirely, close quote. In other words, there was enough evidence apart from Stoltzfus' testimony to convict Strickler, so the Brady materiality standard was not satisfied. 
Beyond the holding, this case is significant because it shows that to decide what is material before trial is a nearly impossible task. It is hard to estimate how much evidence is enough for the jury to convict outside of the context of the presentation of the entire case, which of course cannot be determined until the end of trial. This is what we're calling the materiality trap. I think the problem and the rubber really meets the road as long as materiality is allowed to be included in a prosecutor's determination of what to produce. Uh, Ellen Yaroshevsky did a study actually interviewing prosecutors and found that they were very well versed in what the courts viewed as material, which is supposed to be the review standard, not the initial determination to produce standard. So as long as materiality is conflated with the decision of whether to produce favorable evidence to the defense to begin with, there are going to be intentional or unintentional Brady violations. I don't think it's even fair to ask a prosecutor, or a judge for that matter, to try to decide what is material to the defense. I mean, after all, that's why the Supreme Court said, if there's a question about it, err in favor of disclosure. It is simply unwise to attempt difficult materiality decisions. The best practice is to disclose if the issue of materiality is at all a close one. You know, just to add a little more on this, this is a decision that you, is so hard to make up front. You don't know for sure how the evidence is going to go in trial. You're not sure as a police officer who really who the witnesses that might be called to testify at trial for the defense. We're not sure a lot of times, even before the trial starts, what exactly the defense theory is going to be. So, you know, I don't agree with a lot of things that Ms. Powell says, but this is something that I, I really just want to emphasize, that it is virtually impossible for us to determine this ahead of time, but it's so easy for the defense after trial, after all the dust is settled, to point at why this missing evidence was material to the case. It's very easy, and it's hard to defend sometimes. 10, 15 years later after the trial. So let's move on, let's talk about favorability. The favorability analysis is a bit less daunting, or is it? One case that might help us talk about is Strickler v. Green. This case gives us the categories of favorable evidence. The evidence at issue must be favorable to the accused, either because it's exculpatory or because it is impeaching, which are refined and defined in subsequent cases. Exculpatory seems easy enough to determine. It is simply any evidence that reduces the likelihood of finding the defendant guilty or that would result in a lesser sentence or lighter sentence. But in application, this can be a difficult determination for law enforcement or prosecutor. The fact is the defense, the defendant himself and his attorney, are in the best position to decide whether a piece of evidence is exculpatory. Thus again, like materiality, the best practice is to disclose if there's any chance that a piece of evidence might be exculpatory. You don't you can deal with the materiality and the admissibility on that later, but if you disclose it, we won't be having the cases get reversed after 15, 10, 20 years later. Impeachment evidence relates to witnesses. On cross-examination, the attorneys try to call on the credibility of the other side's witnesses through questioning a myer of things, or the witness on a myer of things such as prior convictions whether someone's on probation or parole, pending criminal charges, bias, contradictory or conflicting statements, dishonest acts, or character for untruthfulness, Rule 608, agreement to testify, false reporting, or inaccuracies in an area of expertise, or all-around thoroughness of the investigation. These are all fair game of impeachment during cross-examination. Giglio versus United States and before it, Napu versus people of the state of Illinois, uh, Giglio being 1972 and Napu being 1959, tell us that impeachment evidence is Brady material and subject to disclosure when the reliability of a given witness may well be determinative of guilt or innocence. Defendants are especially entitled to impeachment evidence for law enforcement witnesses. Law enforcement officers and confidential informants will often be key witnesses. 
in criminal cases. So the reliability may well be determinative of guilt or innocence. As such, impeachment evidence as it relates to law enforcement deserves special treatment here. Confidential informants, flipped co-defendants, testimonial agreements all trigger disclosure of any evidence of an agreement between a witness and law enforcement. That includes any promise, offer, inducement, or payment made to a witness. It doesn't matter if the agreement was formal or informal, it simply must be disclosed. U.S. v. Bagley, another Supreme Court case from 1985, is an excellent example of this. At Bagley's bench trial, where when he was acquitted of a violation of federal firearms charges but convicted of a controlled substance charges, the government offered only two witnesses on the substances. O'Connor and Mitchell, state law enforcement officers who worked as railroad security guards and helped the ATF, helped with the ATF investigation. The defense request for disclosure of any deals, promises, or inducements made to the witnesses in exchange for their testimony in a pretrial motion was answered with O'Connor and Mitchell's sworn affidavits that they did not receive any reward or incentive in the case. However, after trial, it was revealed that the ATF contracts had paid O'Connor and Mitchell in exchange for useful information and Bagley then moved to overturn the conviction because these suppressed con contracts would have been favorable to Bagley's impeachment evidence, the Supreme Court remanded the case to the Ninth Circuit for a Brady determination. So again, we're seeing a pattern here of cases being overturned because of the failure to disclose favorable evidence to the defendant. Because knowledge of the ATF contracts could have given Bagley, this is what they said, could have given Bagley an entirely different trial strategy that, he might, that might have resulted in his acquittal, he might not have waived his right to a jury trial. So this, this is where it's just so hard to know at the time that you're making these decisions. The better thing is to disclose everything. Here the court said the government's failure to disclose the contracts unconstitutionally deprived the defendant of a fair trial. The Ninth Circuit overturned Bagley's convictions on Brady grounds and his sentence was vacated. It is a sticky wicket because we're trying to see the future and the past all at once and guess what could be happening. Uh, in 2006, the Supreme Court decision in Youngblood versus West Virginia underscored the need for prosecutors and law enforcement to work together because Brady is violated when the government fails to turn over evidence that is known only to police investigators and not to the prosecutor. So this is our imputed duty case. It said prosecutors have the duty under Brady to disclose all material impeachment information to the defendant. So we have both the material and favorability standard here. Of course, there are limitations to a prosecutor's Brady duties when a state's laws prevent access to policy uh, police personnel files. But even when there is nothing preventing the police department from reviewing personnel files and disclosing relevant information to the prosecutor. So, uh, regardless of what you, what the law says about what the prosecutor can see, the, the duty remains with the law enforcement officer. Extensive cooperation is important because law enforcement is in the best position to review their files and disclose any potential impeachment information to the prosecutors so that the prosecutor can then decide what is or is not Brady material. This practice, which we'll talk about in detail more later, BEST allows the entire prosecution team, that's the prosecutors, the police, the lab personnel, whoever it may be, to comply with the Brady duty. The duty of knowledge is imputed to the prosecutors based on Kyles versus Whitley uh, from 1995, which defined the duty holder as anyone on the prosecution team. This includes not only the duty to disclose, but also the duty to learn of any favorable evidence known to other law enforcement team members. This brings us to the most recent Ninth Circuit case of Brady implications, Milky v. Ryan, which is worth exploring in detail. Before I really get into facts, you know, this uh, is a case that was tried here in our office in the 90s, early 90s, and then in 2000, in like 2013, the Ninth Circuit made all kinds of findings 
many of which I think a lot of people legitimately have some dispute with. But we're not today going to talk about whether or not Milky, the defendant, is guilty or not, but we're looking at what the court found to be Brady violations so that we can better make sure that we better address those going forward. With that being said, in 1990, Deborah Milky was convicted of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and the kidnapping of her four-year-old son. This was a terrible case. The testimony of the Phoenix police detective, Armando Saldate Jr., was the center of the prosecution's case against Milky because she confessed during his interview to which there were no other witnesses, nor was the interview recorded. In her own testimony, Deborah Milky said her Miranda rights were violated. She denied making any confession and declared her innocence. In short, as this was teed up by the defense and the materiality and all that, this was set up as it was Saldate's word against the defendant's word. And as the Ninth Circuit observed, the state's case rested heavily on Saldate's credibility. The jury believed Saldate and found Milky guilty. 23 years later, Milky's appeal resulted in a Ninth Circuit decision that found that the state's failure to disclose extensive evidence of Saldate's past misconduct, which would have called his credibility into serious question by the jury if it had been revealed on cross-examination, violated Milky's constitutional right to a fair trial, and the conviction was set aside. The misconduct found by the Ninth Circuit now, 23 years later, included Saldate's lying to internal affairs investigators, lying under oath on multiple occasions, Fifth Amendment violations, Fourth Amendment violations, a sexual quid pro quo with the female motorist, lying to the Department of Disciplinary Hearings, and other Miranda violations. The court found that Saldate's credibility was crucial to the state's case against Milky. It's hard to imagine anything more relevant to the juries or the judge's determination whether to believe Saldate than the evidence that Saldate lied under oath and trampled the constitutional rights of suspects in discharging his official duties. If even a single juror, this is the Ninth Circuit talking, if even the single juror had found Saldate untrustworthy based on the documentation that he habitually lied under oath or he took advantage of women he had in his power, there would have been at least a hung jury. Likewise, if this evidence had been disclosed, it may well let the judge to order a new trial or enter judgment notwithstanding the verdict, or at least impose a sentence less than death. The prosecution did its best to impugn Milky's credibility. It wasn't entitled at the same time to hide the evidence to undermine Saldate's credibility. This case is a good summation of the lessons we've learned so far, particularly about the prosecutor's duty to know. As summed up in Kyle's v. Whitley, quote, the individual prosecutor has a duty to learn of any favorable evidence known to the others acting on the government's behalf, including the police. But whether the prosecutor succeeds or fails in meeting this obligation, whether that is a failure to disclose is in good faith or bad faith, the prosecution's responsibility for failing to disclose known favorable evidence rising to a material level of importance is inescapable. The prosecutor is responsible for all Brady evidence in the prosecutor's office, in the police department, and in the offices of any other entity that works on the case on the behalf of the state. This is an overwhelming obligation that requires extensive cooperation between all the various players on the state's team, so to speak. Procedures must be enacted to ensure that the prosecutor is made aware of all Brady evidence. One of, the, one of the real lessons out of this case, too, is that if one prosecutor knows it, it's imputed to all prosecutors in your office. And all the Brady duties are affirmative duties. We have to carry them out, whether we're told to or not. Discovery and disclosure of Brady material to the defense is not optional, even if the defense never asks for it um, by not making a specific request. In the United States versus Augers in 1976, the court said if the evidence is so clearly supportive of a claim of innocence that it gives the prosecution notice of a duty to produce, that duty should equally arise, even if no request is made. So we don't have to sit there and wait for them to do a discovery request for us. We automatically have to turn it over. 
So we've kind of put together this keystone rule that sums everything up that we've said so far. The prosecution team has an affirmative duty to discover and disclose to the defense all evidence in the state's possession that is favorable to the defendant, material to the defendant's guilt or punishment. A violation of this duty can constitute a violation of the defendant's constitutional right to a fair trial. And we've also seen that in many cases it can be a close call. So if it is a close call, uh, if you can't know pre-trial, if the defense is in the best position to know what's the answer, the best practice is to disclose. And then you can deal, you can make have the battle in court pre-trial about whether the evidence is going to be admissible or not. But it's out there and the 20 years later they can't claim they didn't have something. So why do we follow Brady? We have a legal and ethical obligation of course to do so. It's the right thing to do. Hopefully most of us are in this line of work because we want to do the right thing for ourselves, the people we deal with, and for society as a whole. Complying with Brady, as difficult as it may be, is part of doing the right thing. First, we have a legal obligation. I know that most of us here and, and most of us out there in the Internet land, we've sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution. We all have rules of criminal procedure to follow. Here in Arizona, our rules of criminal procedure encompass a lot of what we're talking about. We also have to ensure that each defendant receives a fair trial and an honest conviction. We need to meet the highest standards and maintain our integrity core values in the public trust. This is really important, that slide early on about the trust of police and law enforcement in general is on the rise and that's a good thing. And I think those are the kind of things that will continue to go up as we continue to hold to the highest standards. There is also though a professional liability to police and to prosecutors. You know, speaking for prosecutors, our bar licenses are very much in peril if we, if we do not comply with these. And we have our own special ethical rule, Rule 3.8, for prosecutors. And then Kim's going to talk about how we have potential also for civil liability. Yep, they can sue us all right. Uh, a city could be held civilly liable under a Section 80, 1983 action if the district attorney's deliberate indifference to violations of constitutional rights, an improperly or inadequately trained or unsupervised prosecutor commits a Brady or Giglio error that leads to a wrongful conviction. At least that's what they said in Ramos versus City of New York in 2001. Under federal law, both trial prosecutors and supervisors, and that includes managers and people who do training, have absolute immunity from lawsuits based on fi failure to disclose Brady or Giglio information under the Van de Camp versus Goldstein case. Municipalities and government agencies like prosecution offices, in this case, Harry Connick Sr. in Louisiana, in the case of Connick versus Thompson, can also be held under liable under Section 1983 on a failure to train theory, but only if the defendant can establish that Number one, the prosecutor's office had a deliberate indifference to the need for training on the duty to disclose the type of information at issue in order to prevent violations of constitutional rights. So it has to be specific to the type of inf the evidence that wasn't disclosed. One of the best ways to combat this is in your police departments, your prosecution office, to train regularly on Brady and the duties that arise out of Brady v. Maryland. And second, the second prong of that is that they have to show that there was a wrongful conviction that resulted from the failure to disclose that type of information. And that's what happened in that Connick versus Thompson case, which is pretty recent, 2011. Section 1983 claims are becoming more common against agencies where potential exculpatory information has not been disclosed. So there is civil liability under Section 1983, even though we might have immunity under some other provision. Um, so you have to be careful about not disclosing when it's relating to general exculpatory information and information regarding an officer's truthfulness or credibility. Law enforcement agencies' systematic failure to comply with Brady requirements could also be found as a pattern in practice that might be subject to Section 1983 liability. 
Law enforcement agencies may also incur liability if they fail to train officers, just the same way we saw it, that prosecutors' offices could be held if they fail to train prosecutors regarding the specific Brady requirements relating to that specific case. So since we have this obligation, one way the agencies have tried to comply with Brady is coming up with lists. Some people call them Brady lists, integrity lists. There are different names for them, but I just want to emphasize it's not the blacklist. Defendants are entitled to have informed cross-examination of all witnesses, including police officers. Impeachment material can be critical to their cases, but they are not entitled to know everything about a given police officer. As we have seen, only information that is material and favorable, which typically covers information revealing bias, dishonesty, or misconduct involving moral turpitude. Things like repeated lies to internal affairs officers, reports or inquiries into honesty, competency, reliability, fitness to do the job, filing of false reports, theft of evidence. Those are the kind of things that go at the integrity of the criminal justice system. While a Brady, while Brady material at times can jeopardize an officer's career and may reach the point where it precludes that officer from testifying at all, where the impeachment material would outweigh the value of the testimony. I want to talk about this for a minute. So when a prosecutor is dealing with an, a police officer that's, a, that's critical to the case and there's Brady material with it, the prosecutor has to make a decision. Look, is this witness going to be believable? Are these 12 strangers on the jury going to believe this police officer when he comes with this exculpatory impeachment material? And that's a decision that has to be made because the decision, the legal obligation to disclose it is already done. Brady material, <coughs> excuse me, there is no set list from the Supreme Court defining exactly what to disclose about police officers to comply with Brady. Some states have laws that prevent prosecutors and non-police entities from accessing police personnel files. Even if the law is there that does that, the Constitution does not relieve the prosecutor from having to disclose that. While officers make personal records public, some other officers make personal records public records, but most states fall somewhere in between. The duty disclosed includes exculpatory and impeachment evidence known only to law enforcement. So even if the prosecutor is unaware, the duty still stands. So prosecutors have a duty to discover information known by law enforcement and cannot claim ignorance. So the duty for the prosecutor even if they don't know, they, they have a duty to discover, to seek out, to try to find this. As the Kyle Speed Whitley case tells us, impeachment information can include all manner of personnel related information at the law enforcement office, including disciplinary records, internal affairs investigations. And we should note here that a cover up can be worse than the investigation. You know, the, the investigation might, might, might be something really silly. But then an officer repeatedly lying about it makes it worse than it ever would have been. And also performance evaluations. We're, we're not talking about high school transcripts or college transcripts, private sector job reviews, or even divorce proceedings. Those are not things that are part of the prosecution team. The U.S. Department of Justice actually has a policy, 9-5.100. I don't know where they get their numbering scheme. <laughs> that obligates federal investigative agencies to disclose potential impeachment information to prosecutors in all cases before in which an agent is required to testify and upon request by the prosecutor and includes a list of potential impeachment information that really for us is an ex excellent starting point for identifying uh, what kinds of things we're talking about. This is no substitute for consultation with one's own prosecution agency, but it is instructive. Findings of misconduct that reflect on truthfulness, bias, or integrity, including a finding of lack of candor during a criminal, civil, or administrative inquiry or proceeding, or that is the subject of a pending investigation is one. Past or pending criminal charges, obviously. Judicial findings of untruthful testimony, a knowingly false written statement, engagement in an unlawful search or seizure, illegal confession, something like that. 
a misconduct finding or pending uh, allegation casting substantial uh, question on the accuracy of any evidence the prosecutor intends to rely on to prove an element of a crime or that might have a significant bearing on the admissibility of any prosecution evidence. That includes things like witness testimony, um, those that relate to substantive violations concerning failure to follow legal or agency requirements for collecting and handling evidence, chain of custody for uh, policies relating to obtaining statements, recording communications, um, and getting consent for search for uh, such things like that. And agency procedures for supervising the activities of a cooperating person. You need to follow those, and if you're not following those, obviously that can have an implication. Mandatory protocols for forensic analysis of evidence. That could apply to a lab person that didn't follow the uh, lab protocols for that particular type of evidence. So you can see this expands even beyond just police officers. Information that may suggest bias for or against a defendant. In U.S. versus ABLE, the Supreme Court actually gave us a definition of bias and said it's a term used in the common law of evidence to describe the relationship between a party and a witness which might lead the witness to slant, unconsciously or otherwise, his testimony in favor of or, or for, uh, in favor of or against the party. Bias may be induced by a witness's like, dislike, or fear of a party or by the witness's self-interest, such as staying alive. Uh, this is particularly uh, arising out of a gang situation, so you can imagine the implications there. Proof of bias is almost always relevant because the jury, as a finder of fact and weigher of credibility, has historically been entit entitled to assess all evidence which might bear on the accuracy and truth of a witness's testimony. And then information that might show impairment in the ability to perceive and recall the truth. That's true for any witness. Unsubstantiated or non-credible allegations against a law enforcement officer, as well as those in which the officer is exonerated, are not typically considered Brady material, but sometimes disclosure may be required by a court. Although rare, in those situations the prosecutor really has to take extra care to protect the confidentiality, privacy, and reputation of the officer. And we all understand that reputations matter. The court stated, Lawyers do not have a ready toolkit for their profession. Instead, their professional reputations are the essence of their livelihood. Reputations matter to the court, to clients, to colleagues, and to the public. In a specialized arena such as criminal defense, the professional circle is even more circumscribed. That's true for prosecutors as well. And so I think, yes, scrutinize, yes, bring the things, but ad hominem, ad hominem attacks against individual prosecutors or judges who don't rule your way, I think disserve the courts and disserve us all as a society. I'll just say it again. Reputations do matter. And although the U.S. Attorney Durkin's comments are directed to prosecutors and judges in the audience, I know, working with law enforcement all around the state of Arizona, and many of you who signed up today, I know, and I, I know all of us would agree our reputations matter, and we want to protect those. Prosecutors and law enforcement management and unions included all must remain committed to transparency, fairness, due process, and guard against the political issues that can affect these kinds of issues, such as political witch hunts, favoritism, and such. The law enforcement role basically consists of four parts, collecting, documenting, training, notice, and record keeping. So on collect and document, let me talk about that. Obviously, police departments have an interest in keeping their personal records confidential. Criminal defense attorneys are the last people to whom the police department like to reveal a personnel file. But that is just what they may have to do in some cases. For example, in U.S. v. Henthorne, a Ninth Circuit case, the case was reversed and remanded, instructing the government that the obligation to examine the files arises by virtue of the defense making a demand for their production. Henthorne requested an in-camera review of the personnel files of all law enforcement witnesses and that the, the prosecution tend to call a trial so they could find any evidence of perjury or other dishonesty or impeachment purposes 
and the prosecution refused, said, hey, there's no materiality. This case points out the need to examine all the files in order to make that very, very difficult determination of materialities, of materiality. While other circuits have come out differently, for instance, some require a showing from the defendant that there is impeachment material or evidence in the personnel file, it remains true that lack of credibility is exculpatory by its very nature, and the request in Henthorne went to evidence relating to that credibility. Investigate all administrative and criminal proceedings for officers and other prosecution witnesses, crime lab personnel, etc., whether it be exculpatory or impeachment evidence. Remember that the prosecution is aware of how sensitive this material is and will only disclose it to the defense if it's deemed necessary in order to do so to comply with Brady. We've talked a little bit about training. Every employee who is a potential witness needs training because they need to be able to recognize potential evidence, including complete administrative and criminal investigations in lieu of agreements, promises, inducements, records of substantial or sustained misconduct regarding veracity or unsatisfactory performance, especially with an expert witness, physical evidence, contradictory statements from witnesses, information that tends to point to the defendant's innocence, and payments between police and confidential informants. We need to disclose that evidence to the prosecutor who will make a determination regarding disclosure to the defense, but you have to have the training to be able to recognize those things in the first place. And then we also suggest giving notice. Notice of the disclosure of evidence should be provided to the officer or employee that is being um, revealed. And they should be given a chance to review that material pursuant to any agency policy that you might adopt. Record keeping is also a best practice and we suggest notations in the employee file of disclosure and of any applicable court orders. There is much talk of the Brady List, which is essentially the prosecutor's record of the information provided through this process. We would simply tell you that part of the record keeping function in both the law enforcement and prosecution offices is to conduct this onerous process in the most efficient manner possible. It only makes sense to keep files of the individuals involved and the information disclosed on hand so that each time a witness will appear, we can make the disclosure without having to repeat the in-depth research required. However, it should never be a conclusion that such a list is anything other than a method of compliance with the overarching duty, nor should the information be used for any other purpose. Clearly, Brady can be implicated even when an officer is cleared of wrongdoing or gets some misconduct finding overturned, if their credibility as a witness remains an issue. For Brady purposes, an incident can follow an officer for the life of their career. Prosecutors then can develop processes to address those concerns. One, give the officer an opportunity to tell his side of the story. Two, provide the officer recourse within the prosecutor's office for challenging the decision to place the officer on the Brady list. Three, set a time frame after which the information would be too remote to be relevant. Let's say it happened 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, four, allow the officer to contribute material to rehabilitate their credibility. These approaches should be thoroughly vetted in the context of the development of any policy and procedures within each prosecution office for me meeting the Brady duty. So we've attached here a handout section, a sample letter that's been used in Louisiana uh, primarily to generate a cooperative, efficient prosecution slash law enforcement relationship that we hope you'll find useful to use or reuse. It should be sent at least, we recommend you send at least once a year and you, and you train on it perhaps once or twice a year. These are the components of the letter if you want to look at it. But basically, the, in, in the letter, you define the Brady rule. You define what's fa it's favorable to the defense. No requests need to be made by the defense. You talk about what is material, which is, as we said, is if there's a reasonable probability that the evidence, that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different. And we know how hard that is to really tell. Um, it also tells the person in the letter that, look, suppression is a due process violation. There's no good faith exemption. If it's in the possession of the prosecutor or the police and it's not disclosed, that's a due process violation. 
And we put in there that now the Supreme Court, their guidance has said, look, if it's a close call in any way, err on the side of disclosure. Remember, again, the prosecutor can bad, make the battle pre-trial about admissibility of any information. Impeachment evidence is also in the letter defined as exculpatory. Even inadmissible evidence can still be considered Brady. That's where we come in in our pre-trial court hearings. Uh, you can put in the letter that it applies to government witnesses. Law enforcement must, it tells, it instructs law enforcement, they must document and collect exculpatory evidence that they learn, whether it's from criminal or administrative investigation. Law enforcement must train, reminds them that they have a due process duty to train all their employees on Brady obligations. You could say in there that law enforcement shall investigate complaints regarding police officers according to their policies. And they must review internal investigation files to determine if Brady exists for its employees who may be called as witnesses. Sustained findings, uh, uh, sustained findings only, factual findings only. You don't disclose things like rumors or innuendos, but dishonesty or untruthfulness, regardless of the punishment, must be disclosed. Criminal convictions, disciplinary actions may be exculpatory. When someone gets demoted, or if they resign in ex instead of being fired under some kind of cloud, oftentimes that needs to be disclosed. Pending or unresolved investigations are not included here, but if you think it will confirm any of the above, you may want to give it to the prosecutor's office so they can make the legal determination. We also put in there that it, in the letter that, hey, we're going to give notice to the affected officer and we'll strongly encourage that officer in question to be given an opportunity to explain. And then that needs to be tracked. So to summarize, uh, the keystone is ready for the superglue that will hold our integrity in place. That is fundamental to attaining the trust that we need from the public in order to have the best criminal justice system possible. Simply following the affirmative duty to disclose material and favorable evidence provides a level of cooperation between the courts, the lawyers, and law enforcement that not only meet our constitutional requirements, but ensure justice through fairness, which is the service to the community that drives us all to these occupations. I just we, want to add that you know we're in this together. We're a team, as this is shown here, and we want to make sure that we do everything we can to do when the police work a case, we want to work it as hard as we can on the law, on the prosecution side. And then the courts want it to be a fair trial. We all want the same thing. We are all guardians of the system. We have re reserved a few minutes for questions, if anybody has a question. Kim, John, thank you so much. There was a lot of great information, and we do have just a few minutes uh, for questions. The first question that we have is when new information is discovered post-conviction, does the prosecutor continue to have a duty to disclose? Aaron, I, I'll take that. Uh, under Ethical Rule 3.8 now, I can't speak for every state, but in Arizona and the ABA standard, yes. Uh, there, there's a standard of level that has to be, just not just any evidence, but something that gives you reason to think or to call into question the conviction. Great. Thank you. And uh, next question is, is disclosure required regarding admissions of a police officer that were made prior to police employment? The example that they provide is an applicant admits that they took a pizza without paying for it when working as a pizza delivery person in college. Was there, well, it would depend on if there was a record of that. I, I really think, Aaron, Aaron, the answer is no. You're talking about something that happened years and years ago and not while they were a law enforcement officer. But, it, you know, if there's any question, err on the side disclosing it. Uh, but, you know, if they're subsequently becoming a police officer and going through the training and all that, uh, jumping through all the hoops that you have to do to be qualified as an officer, it's likely that that information is too far in the past to even be relevant. So uh, best I idea is to give it to the prosecutor so you can figure that out, but uh, that doesn't mean it will ultimately get disclosed. Sure. Great. Well, thank you both very much again. That's all the time that we have for questions today. Uh, Kim, John, do either of you have any final closing comments for our audience? Well, we really appreciate uh, everybody uh, participating today and uh, 
look forward to um, having other people share in this webinar as it will remain on your site for a while, correct? Uh, correct. We're also providing it to the Maricopa County Attorney, the actual recording. I'm not sure what they're going to be doing with it. Uh, John, you'd probably know better about that. Thank you. All right. And with that, thank you all very much and have a great and safe week. Take care.